So this morning we're going to look at a beautiful prayer. Uh, most of the Psalms, all 150 of them, are prayers, and uh, they are beautiful. And I hope that you use them when you are praying because they, they lift up our souls and our hearts in ways that uh, we as humans have a hard time expressing, but the psalmist certainly did express uh, delights of their hearts. So for this morning, we're going to be looking at Psalm 84, Psalm 84, a beautiful prayer regarding heavenly delight. Let's pray and uh, get our hearts ready to worship through this beautiful psalm. <clears throat> Our Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day you have given to us. Thank you for the fall colors which remind us of the seasons and, Lord, that uh, as long as they are here and you have uh, provided them for us, we know that you have promised to uh, not destroy the earth again until the time comes when you come and take us home. And we're just thankful for the reminder. We're also reminded that even though the seasons change, you do not. You are the same today, yesterday, and forever, and we are so thankful. We can count on you. We can, we can bank on your goodness and your protection and your love and your mercy to us. So, Father, I would ask for our morning that you would be pleased to dwell with us, that you would be pleased with our hearts as we meditate on this beautiful prayer. I pray for myself, Lord, that you would keep my mind alert and focused on the task at hand and keep me from saying anything that would lead anyone astray. Lord, may my words be uh, chosen by you and may I speak as if you were speaking. Father, as you have commanded, if anyone has the gift of teaching, they're to use it as if God is speaking and that's a, that's a humbling responsibility for those of us who have the gift of teaching. So Father, I do pray that you would guide my words for your glory and for the hearts of each of these women. In Christ's name, amen. Well, as most of you know, a few years ago, my husband passed away. And when he did pass away, there were two subjects that I was really, really curious about. And I devoured quite a few books. The first subject was on how to grieve. I'd never been a widow. I'd been married almost 46 years. And I'd never been widowed. And so I didn't know how to grieve and how to go through that in a God-honoring way. So I read a lot of books about widowhood and about how to grieve to the glory of God. The second subject that I read a lot of books on was heaven. I knew that Doug would not come back to me, but I would go to him someday. And even though I had read the Bible and I knew what the Bible said about heaven, I was just so curious, and I wanted to know what was he doing, what was his body like, what was going on, and I missed him so much, and I still do. I'm really sorry uh, that it took the death of my precious husband to cause me to think of heaven more than I normally would. Ladies, when you think about it, we should be thinking about heaven every day. Why? Because that's where our dearest friend is, right? That's where my husband is, not my dearest friend, but our dearest friend is the Lord Jesus. And our Lord is preparing our eternal home for us in heaven. He's gone to prepare a place for us, right? So ladies, do you think of heaven much? Do you long to go there? A pilgrim in this foreign land will certainly think about heaven and their desire to be there. And Psalm 84 is a prayer to pray when contemplating heaven, but it's also, it's a twofold prayer, a prayer to pray when you're contemplating heaven, but also a prayer to pray when you're longing to be in God's house here on earth, to go to worship. Now, just a little bit about this psalm. Uh, psalm 84 is a pilgrim song, psalm, even though it's not associated with the pilgrim psalms, which are Psalm 120 through 134. And you might say, well, what's a pilgrim psalm? Well, these were psalms or prayers or songs that were written that the Jews would sing on their way to Jerusalem. It was a joyous time. The families would gather together and they would walk along the roads and, you know, it wasn't just like us. We can get in our car and come down to church, but they would have to travel by foot. And so as they would go to the tabernacle in Jerusalem, there would be certain songs that they would sing. And so these prayers or these psalms were written in light of that. And they would sing in unison. It would be a wonderful time together as they would go through the valleys and the hills 
hills to get to Jerusalem to worship. So ladies, Psalm 84 is a song, it's a prayer for one who is longing for worship here right now, but also for those of us who are longing for heaven, that time when we will be with God forever in his presence, worshiping him forever. And so we're gonna look at this prayer from both aspects as we study it this morning. We're gonna look at it as a pilgrim who's longing for worship now, uh, hopefully in your local church, but also in heaven in the future. So this psalm, uh, if you have a Bible, the psalm that the title over it says it's uh, written to the chief musician upon Giddeth. And Giddeth, that may not make sense to us, but it was a musical instrument that was from the inhabitants of Gath. Psalm 8 is also written to the musician at Giddeth. Uh, psalm 8 is a psalm that David wrote after he defeated Goliath, a beautiful uh, psalm, Psalm 8. It's also a psalm, uh, my Bible says, for the sons of Korah. Uh, some people believe that actually one of the sons of Korah wrote this psalm. Some people believe David wrote this, and others still believe that maybe a Levite wrote it. So we're not for sure uh, as we study this this morning, but one, probably one of those three. But let's read the prayer in its entirety, Psalm 84. How lovely are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul, soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Yes, the sparrow has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they who dwell in thy house, they will still be praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and whose heart are the ways of them who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well, the rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord God of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in thee. We have a threefold outline this morning for this beautiful prayer. First of all, the psalmist's descriptions of the house of God, the descriptions of the house of God, verses 1 to 3. Secondly, the psalmist's delights of being in the house of God, his delights of being in the house of God, verse 4 to 7. And then lastly, the psalmist's desire to dwell in the house of God, his desire to dwell in the house of God, verses 8 to 12. So his descriptions, his delights, and his desire to dwell in the house of God. He starts out by saying, as he prays, how lovely are your tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. How dear is your dwelling place. How beloved is your dwelling place. The tabernacle we know was a physical as well as a symbolic representation of God's presence among his people. Why? Ladies, the tabernacle in the biblical world is where the Lord dwelt. They would go there and worship the Lord. So if you're taking notes, the first description of the house of God, it's lovely. It is lovely. Now, the psalmist can't describe just how lovely it is, but it's lovely. It's dear. Why? Because God dwells there. Ladies, do you ever stop and consider how lovely the Lord's house is? This place that we're in right now, it doesn't really matter what type of building we worship in. It could be a beautiful building with stained glass windows. It could be a, you know, a metal building. I know uh, our second church that my husband planted, we met in a metal building for a while over at 51st and Garnett. It didn't matter the kind of building. It was coming there to worship the Lord and be with God's people. The type of building doesn't really matter. It's still lovely, why? because God is there. He's dwelling with us, and his people are there that we worship. Ladies, no matter what church you attend, remember God is there. It's a lovely place, and I hope as you come to worship on Sunday morning that you think about that. How lovely is your place? Why? Because you're there, God, and because my brothers and sisters are there. But ladies, in thinking about heaven, we know heaven's lovely too, right? 
If you did your homework, you saw in Revelation 21, 22, heaven's pretty lovely, right? It's a pretty lovely place. None of us have been there, even, so, even though some have written books and said they've been there and back, but uh, we know it's lovely, right? It's going to be lovely. Eye has not seen nor ears heard what God has prepared for those of us who love him. Well, it's interesting the psalmist uses the, the term, a plural here, how lovely are your tabernacles, your dwelling places. Why does he say that? Well, remember, the tabernacle was movable. As we saw last, I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, when Solomon wrote the prayer of dedication for the temple, that was a permanent place. Uh, but in before that, there were tabernacles, and so they would pick up and move it and, and keep on moving it. It was movable. And so that could be the reason uh, for the plural form, form here. Here. But also, the psalmist might be referring to the many facets of the tabernacle. Remember, the tabernacle was divided into different courts. There was the court place, there was the holy place, and there was the most holy place, which only the priests were allowed to go into. But ladies, we also know that heaven in, in the book of the Revelation is described as a holy city, and yet it has 12 gates. And it has a lot of rooms. In fact, Jesus told the disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them. And he said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places, many. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And it's interesting, when, when Jesus says to his 12 disciples, minus Judas, uh, he's not going to be there, uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you, I, it means I'm going to prepare a place for you, for you, for you, individual dwelling places. So ladies, I don't know if you've ever thought about your place in heaven. I don't know what, you know, mine's going to look like. I have no idea. But God is preparing an individual dwelling place for each one of us. And you know what? It's going to be lovely because God is lovely. But when thinking about our, our, our earthly dwelling place, our church, ladies, think of your church. Every room is a part of the, of the church, right? We have the sanctuary, we have the lobby, we have Sunday school rooms, we have offices, we have the foyer, we have the kitchen, we have nursery, we have halls, we have bathrooms, aren't you thankful for those? But do you ever realize all of these rooms in this building are part of the Lord's house and they're lovely? And ladies, we should treat them as such. And for those of you that have children, I hope you are training your children to treat the Lord's house with respect. It's a lovely place. It is where God dwells. It's where we come on Sunday to worship him. Now, note before we go on, the psalmist calls God, O Lord of hosts. And he uses this term four times in this prayer. And it's a word which describes God as Lord over everything, including heaven and earth. Ladies, he created the heavens and the earth. Well, in thinking about the earthly tabernacle or the heavenly tabernacle causes the psalmist to cry out in his prayer. Look at verse 2. My soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My soul is longing. It's pale. I'm weak. I, I want to be in your house so much, but I'm weak and pale thinking about this. Ladies, this is a longing that makes one exhausted. And the desire of the psalmist was, I want to be in your house. It, it's so intense. Uh, my longing to want to be there. I feel weak. I feel pale. Ladies, does that describe your longing for Sunday worship? Do you long to be there? Are you disappointed when you can't come to church on Sunday? Do you long to be there? Do you long to go to heaven? The psalmist says, I'm fainting. I'm consumed with my longing. I'm going to waste away unless my wish, my prayer is gratified. Now again, ladies, I ask you, does that describe your longing for worship? I remember the first time that I studied this psalm years ago, I hadn't eaten for almost 24 hours. I don't know why now, but there must have been a reason. And I will tell you, I was, I was pe feeling pretty faint, pretty exhausted, not for the courts of the Lord, but for food. <laughs> and you know what? As I was studying this psalm, I had to ask myself, Susan, do you have those same intense feelings for God? Are you longing for him? Do you think you're going to die if you can't have him? Do you long for his house? Do you long to go to the house of the Lord? Do you long to go to heaven? 
The psalmist says he's fainting, what? For the courts of the Lord. What are the courts of the Lord? Well, the word here is used to describe the different areas around the tabernacle. There was a south side, north side, east side, and west side, and there was also an entrance, which we know the sons of Korah would stand outside and be there. Well, not only is the psalmist's prayer longing for God, but now he says, my heart, my flesh, they cry out for the living God. The word cry here signifies a shrill. In fact, the Hebrew word is very interesting. Uh, it describes a baby that's hungry. Have you ever seen a baby that's really, really hungry and, and all of a sudden they're crying and their hands are shaking and their feet are, you know, their whole body is just, it's shaking because they're so hungry. That's the Hebrew word here. I'm fainting, I'm longing, I'm crying. My, my whole body, my flesh is crying out for the living God. It's the same idea that Peter uses in 1 Peter when he says we're to desire the milk of the word, the pure milk of the word, like that newborn baby that thinks that uh, his life depends on the next feeding from the mother's breast. They're crying, they're aching for that milk. Ladies, that's the same way it is to be for our longing to be in God's house. He says, I long for nothing but to be in your house. And ladies, notice, he specifies what kind of a God. You are the living God. My heart, my flesh, they cry out for the living God. Why does he say living? Because in his time, there was a lot of dead gods. There was a lot of idolatry, a lot of heathen worship. Ladies, just like there is in our day, do you know there's over 4,000 cults and religions today in the world, 4,000. 4,000, that is a lot. But I hope your heart is longing for the real God, the living God, not some dead God or some God we have imagined in our mind. So the psalmist's whole being, did you notice here? His whole being is crying out for God, his soul, his heart, his flesh. Ladies, what does your soul and your flesh cry out for? One of the Puritan writers said this, the desires of the heart are the best proofs of our salvation. The desires of our heart are the best proofs of salvation. Ladies, you can counterfeit the things you say. You cannot counterfeit the things you desire. You can counterfeit the things you say with your mouth, but you can never counterfeit the things you desire. Well, the psalmist continues with his description as he prays. Look at verse 3. Yes, the sparrow has found a house, the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my king and my God. Now, this is a little bit tricky to interpret, but uh, there's two th thoughts here. I don't hold to the first one, but the second one makes more sense. First of all, the psalmist could be referring here to the birds, the sparrows, the swallows. They had found a nesting place around the tabernacle and the altars. They built their nest there. And what's he saying? I wished I, too, could build a nest like the birds and have a permanent dwelling place there by the altars. But that makes no sense to me because I don't know of any little birdies that want their little feathers burned, because the altars were used for what? Offering animal sacrifices. So if you have a big flame there, no little birdie wants to make his nest there and have his uh, feathers burned off. So that doesn't make much sense. But the second idea, which makes a lot of sense to me, is the psalmist is meditating on the fact even the birds have a permanent dwelling place. Ladies, if you've ever seen a bird uh, make a nest and then they lay their young and then they, they stay in there while they feed their young until they fly away, it's a, it's a permanent resting place. And then he says even the altars have a permanent resting place. The altars, remember there was two altars, the brazen and the golden altar. And so the psalmist is saying the birds have a permanent dwelling place they have their nest. The altars have a permanent dwelling place, but I don't have a permanent dwelling place. I don't have a permanent dwelling place. So ladies, the second description of the house of God, it's a place of rest. The psalmist says, I want a place of rest where I can rest. Ladies, do you ever think about the Lord's day being a place of rest? I know I do. Um, 
that is the one, that is a high day. That was a high day for my husband and I. And even on the way to church, he would say, can you believe we get to go to church today? We get to worship today? Ladies, it's a day of the week where you can leave all your troubles from the week, uh, your labors, your toils, your trials. You come into the house of the Lord. You get to worship. You're with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a time of rest. It's a place of rest. And ladies, our eternal dwelling place will be a place of rest, right? It's going to be a wonderful place of rest. So the psalmist's descriptions of the house of God, he describes it in two ways. It's lovely and it's a place of rest. When you read the descriptions of heaven in Revelation, you certainly read about a place that is lovely and a place of rest. So let me ask you, do you consider your church, the one you go to, a lovely place to be and a place of rest? If not, why not? Well, let's move on to the psalmist's delights of being in the house of God. Look at verse 4. Blessed are they who dwell in your house. Oh, happy are they who abide in your courts. Oh, the happiness of the man who settles down in your house, who is constantly there. So, ladies, the first delight of being in the house of God is you're blessed or you're happy. You're blessed or happy. And the psalmist here is probably referring to the Levites, the son of Korah, to whom this psalm was written for, because remember they were employed around the temple and they lived in the residences nearby. And so blessed are they, happy are they who dwell in your house. But ladies, in thinking about heaven, do you know you're going to be blessed there? You're going to be happy there. Revelation 19.9 says this, Blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Ladies, there's going to be no crying in heaven. We're going to be happy for eternity. Can you imagine? Do you feel happy and blessed when you are in church? If not, you might want to do some heart evaluation. Because we should feel blessed. We should be happy. Well, there's a second delight of being in the house of God. Notice what he says. We will still be praising you. We will be giving you glory. We will be giving you radiance. The Septuagint reads like this. We will praise you for ages of ages. We will always be praising you. Remember in 2 Chronicles 20, 19, it says the Korathites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice. Praising God was their job. But ladies, it's our job. I love our new pastor, what he has been saying. When you sing, sing loud. And I'm singing louder, but nobody else is. And my grandson one time said, Grandma, I don't like standing by you in church. You sing so loud. And uh, so finally, when Matt says sing loud, I'm like, Yes. We should praise the Lord, even if you don't have a beautiful voice, ladies, you know, make a joyful noise, and some of you can make a noise, right? But I, sometimes I, I look at people singing, and I'm like, I, do they really know what they're singing? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, you know, like, what? Okay. But we should be singing, right, with joy and sing loud. They praise the Lord with a loud voice, it says. Ladies, you and I have that wonderful privilege on Sunday. Even, even before I got up to teach, we have a wonderful opportunity to worship the Lord with song. But also in heaven, we're going to be praising him. Je Revelation 19.6, John writes this. I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord uh, God omnipotent reigneth. Now, interesting, right after this end of this uh, portion of the psalmist's prayer, he says, Selah. Selah. What does this mean? Well, it's a musical notation for the singers to stop and the instruments stop playing. But it also means stop. Think about this. So ladies, think about it. We will be praising the Lord forever and ever. Stop and think about him. But I guess the question is, do you praise him now? When you come to church on Sunday morning and you sing songs, is it from your heart? And I hope you praise him throughout the, the week, the day. We should be praising him. Well, the psalmist goes on to further describe this blessed condition of those in God's house in verse 5. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. 
whose, whose hearts are the way of them. So ladies, this is a third delight of being in the house of God. We are strong. It gives us strength. Ladies, attending church should strengthen your spiritual muscles. It should strengthen your faith. It should make you stronger in the Lord. I remember my son told me recently when I was going through a challenging time a few years ago, and he said, Mom, when the church ceases to be the means of grace for you, then it ceases to be the church. What was he saying? Church is meant to what? Equip the saints, to strengthen our muscles. Uh, it's a place where we can come and we can be fed the word of God and we're stronger and we leave better because of having been in the house of the Lord. We're strong. It strengthens our spiritual muscles. We're strengthened from the teaching of the word of God. I, I hope you're strengthened on Sunday morning when you come to church, Sunday night, Tuesday, that, that your spiritual arms are strengthened. You feel stronger as a Christian, but also because you've been with God's people, right? Even your small groups where you talk with the other ladies and, and you're strengthened by hearing their answers to their homework. You're strengthened by hearing them pray. And ladies, if going to church doesn't strengthen your spiritual muscles, then again, you might ask why. Because it should be a place to come where you are strengthened and where you are made strong. Well, the psalmist goes on to pray, in whose heart are the ways of them? Now, this is a little bit tricky, but it means the highways are in their hearts. Uh, 27 times this is mentioned in the Old Testament, and it really is just translated highways. It means the highways leading to the sanctuary. Remember what I said in the introduction? Uh, the Jews would travel on roads, on highways to get to the sanctuary. And what they're saying is, as they travel down these highways uh, with their families and they're going to Jerusalem, these roads lead them to the sanctuary and they're happy thinking about the fact that they're going to get to worship the Lord. Their affections are there. And so it was a festive occasion and it was a wonderful time for them to be excited about getting to go to worship. Ladies, what do you think about on your way to church? Are you excited to get there? Can't wait to get there? As I mentioned, my husband and I used to just revel in the fact that we would get to go to worship on Sunday. It should be an exciting time for you and your family. And, all, and you know, in thinking about heaven, we too are blessed when our hearts are thinking about our way to that new Jerusalem. I hope your heart is happy to think about your eternal home. Is your heart focused on that highway to heaven? Is your mind set on heavenly things? I hope so. Well, as the pilgrims would be on their way to Jerusalem to worship, they would pass by the valley of Baca. And you might wonder what this is. Look at verse 6. Who passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a well. The rain also fills the pool. Now, this is a little bit challenging because some say Baca is a reference to the Valley of Bochum that's mentioned in Judges 21. Uh, it received this name because of the weeping of the Jews because they were uh, punished before because of their disobedience to the Lord. But others say that Baca is the Valley of Mulberry Trees uh, that is mentioned in 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles. And these trees uh, would be on the, each side of the road as they headed to Jerusalem. And they say that they would stop by these mulberry trees and they would pick the fruit off of the tree and they would eat it on their way as they were traveling to Jerusalem because it was very refreshing. But also, these Baca trees had thorns and thistles. And so a lot of times to get to the fruit, as they were getting to the fruit to eat, uh, they would get scratched and, you know, beat up uh, from the fruit. And so it's interesting when you, when you look at what he's saying here, because they couldn't pass by these trees and get the fruit off the tree without a lot of labor and sometimes tears. I mean, if you've ever been scratched by a thorn, it's not much fun because you usually start bleeding. And so the Valley of Baca here seemed to be, as the pilgrims would pass along their way, on their way to Jerusalem, uh, they would have to go by and these things as they would eat them, but still they would, they would suffer a little bit physically. So what is he saying here? Well, when passing through Baca, the Valley of Tears, the pilgrims would make that gloomy valley like a well filled with water. It wouldn't bother them. Why? Because the strength of the Lord. They knew they were getting to go to worship. 
Ladies, it's just like us. We're on our way to heaven, right? There's lots of thorns. <laughs> There's lots of valleys. Sometimes it's refreshing fruit, but we have a lot of valleys. We have a lot of hills. Just like Job when he was going through his, his horrific trial, you know what he said? He does give songs in the night. He does give songs in the night. Or the Apostle Paul who's singing in jail, you know? He's on his way to glory someday, but he is singing in jail. How do we do that? By the strength given from God. And ladies, in thinking about our pilgrimage to the heavenly city, we've got to go through a lot of valleys. Uh, through much tribulation, we enter the kingdom of heaven. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The Christian life is not all rosy, peachy king. <laughs> It's trials, isn't it? It's difficult. It is difficult. But it's a beautiful picture that the psalmist gives here. Just like the rain which fills the pools. What's he saying? The rains would cover the arid valleys with pools of water. It's a vivid picture of God's blessing on those who are faithful. It's like a pool of water. Well, in thinking about these valleys, the, psalm, the psalmist says in verse 7, he says they go from strength to to strength. They obtain one victory after another. What's he saying? Ladies, we grow stronger every day in our pilgrimage to heaven, right? We should be growing stronger every day in our pilgrimage to glory. Ladies, in this life, there are many things we encounter, trials, disappointments, dangers, but God is our strength. We go from strength to strength. How? By God who supplies the strength. Ladies, our strength becomes stronger. Our difficulties seem to diminish. I know as I get older in the Lord and older physically, things don't rattle me like they used to. And I know that's same for you. Uh, we're changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And sometimes I, I look back at the things I used to get upset set by, and I go, that's ridiculous. Why'd you get upset about that stupid stuff? But uh, ladies, we should, we should be growing stronger, right? Our faith should be stronger in the Lord. He is our strength. As the psalmist says in Psalm 1832, it's God who girds us with strength. So as we go on this pilgrim journey to heaven and we have trials and, and we have thorns and we have thistles, we have God who girds us with strength. Well, the psalmist goes on to pray, every one of them in Zion appears before God. What's he saying? Well, Zion is a city of Jerusalem, the place where all the pilgrims were, were going to worship the Lord. And the idea here is that all of those that are on their way would appear in Zion, the place of worship. And ladies, so it is with all Christians. All who persevere to the end will appear in Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. So the delights of being in the house of God are threefold. We're blessed, we praise God, and we are strong. Well, the psalmist now shifts in his prayer in verses 8 to 12 to cry out to God regarding his desire to dwell in the house of God. So look at this uh, beautiful picture that he paints here in this prayer, his desire to dwell in the house of God. Look at verse 8. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. What prayer is he talking about? The prayer he's praying. <laughs> Please, the prayer, I want to have a place to worship you. I want my heart to dwell in Zion. I want to go to the tabernacle. I want to go to worship. And he says, give ear, lend an ear, listen to my prayer, O God of Jacob. And I think it's interesting that the psalmist uses this particular name for God right here. O God of Jacob. Remember Jacob? What did Jacob do? He wrestled all night in prayer with God. Remember what Jacob said? I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. I'm not going to let you go. That's the idea that the psalmist is praying here. Listen, O God of Jacob, don't let me go until you bless me by answering my prayer to be able to go to the tabernacle and worship. I'm not going to let you go until you let me go to worship. Ladies, is that the cry of your heart? How long, oh Lord? You know, we get to come here on Sundays, but what about your heavenly home? 
How long, O oh Lord? How much longer is it going to be? Lord, please answer my prayer. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I want to be with you in heaven for eternity. Ladies, do you ever pray that? And by the way, some of us do pray that, but our motives aren't pure, right? Because <laughs> you just want to get out of here. <laughs> but, uh, and I understand that, but our desire should want to be to depart and to be with the Lord. Well, the psalmist's desire to be in the house of God, if you're taking notes, is so intense that he will wrestle with God until God answers his prayer. The psalmist's desire to be in the house of God is so intense that he will wrestle with God until God answers his prayer. And then he says, Selah, stop and think about this. Stop and think about this. Ladies, do you long to worship? Is your craving intense that you will wrestle with God until he answers your prayer? And when you can't get to church on Sunday for some reason, is that desire so intense that you would pray, oh, Lord, make a way where I can get there? And ladies, let me just say this. If you don't long to worship here, you're not going to like heaven. <laughs> you are not going to like heaven because that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be serving but we are going to be worshiping the Lord. Well, the psalmist goes on to pray in verse 9. Behold, O God, our shield, look upon the face of your anointed. Now, why does he call God a shield? Well, a shield is what? An emblem of protection. And the pilgrims are going on their way to Jerusalem, and they would need God to protect them. Ladies, we're on our way to heaven. <laughs> And we need protection, too. But, yay, coming to church on Sunday morning, we need God's protection anymore. Uh, I feel like I'm dodging. I don't know this morning, just coming. Uh, Fifteen minutes, I think it takes me to get here. I think there was two or three times that I moved my car over a little bit because, um, you know, I, what, is, what do they say? One out of every ten Tulsans are driving impaired, and the other nine, I think, are texting. And so, you know, Lord, please protect me on the way to go to worship because uh, there's crazy drivers out there, right? And uh, so he, he looks at the Lord as a shield, as protection. But, lady, he's also our protection as we journey our way to heaven. And notice what he prays next. Look upon the face of your anointed. Look favorably upon me. Look favorably upon me because of your kindness. Please answer my prayer. Well, the psalmist continues to cry out regarding his desire for worship in verse 10. And notice what he prays. For a day in your court is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. The psalmist is praying here. He's thinking about how one day serving God was better than spending a thousand days doing something else. One day with the Lord is better than a thousand anywhere else. Ladies, is that the cry of your heart? Would you rather spend one day with the Lord then a thousand days on a vacation, a thousand days of shopping. Would a day with the Lord be better to you than a thousand days with your family, your friends, yourself? Think about that. Secondly, if you're taking notes, the psalmist's desire to dwell in the house of God is so intense that he would rather be there one day than a thousand somewhere else. The psalmist's desire to dwell in the house of God is so intense that he would rather be there one day than a thousand somewhere else. And then he goes on to further describe this. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Some read this like this. I would rather be fixed to a post in the house of my God than live at liberty in the tents of the wicked. You know what the psalmist is saying here? I would re rather be serving God in the lowliest place, a doorkeeper, <laughs> a keeper at the door. In our day and age, we'd say the guy that has to run security on Sunday morning. I would rather do that than to dwell among the ungodly. The keeper of the door would have to stand at the entrance to the tabernacle, and they wouldn't be allowed to come in. So I'd rather stand outside and be that close to the house of worship than to dwell with the wicked. Ladies, would you rather serve in the lowliest position in your church, maybe even scrubbing the toilets, <laughs> rather than hang out in the bars with the wicked? 
Well, when we think about this verse in terms of our eternal home, ladies, we're not sure exactly what we're going to be doing in heaven, but we know we're going to be serving in some capacity. But ladies, no matter what job the Lord gives us, it's going to be better than dwelling with the wicked in hell, right? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to go there. So the psalmist's desire, thirdly, if you're taking notes, his desire to dwell in the house of God is so intense that he would rather serve in a lowly position than to dwell with the wicked. His desire to be in the house of God is so intense that he would rather serve in a lowly position than to dwell with the wicked. Now, why would the psalmist rather be a doorkeeper in God's house instead of being able to dwell inside the tent of the wicked? Well, he tells us why in verse 11 as he prays. Look what he says. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. Interesting, God being referred to as a sun is not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture, only here. Why is he using this term? Well, ladies, just think, think about it. As a pilgrim traveling to Jerusalem to worship, they would need what? The warmth of the sun, also the shield for protection. God provided both of these for them. But you know, in thinking about heaven, listen to this. This is amazing. John says in the book of the Revelation, the city has no need of the sun <laughs> nor the moon to shine. Why? For the glory of God is going to lighten it and the lamb is the light. No sun in heaven. He is the sun, right? And there's going to be, we're going to be protected in heaven. There's no way, the Revelation says, nothing that defiles is going to enter into heaven. We're going to be protected. Ladies, the Lord will be our eternal sun and our shield. Not only is he light and protection, but the psalmist goes on to pray, the Lord will give grace and glory. He will give us kindness. Ladies, on our pilgrimage, we certainly need grace and glory, don't we? I don't know about you, but I need grace every day. I need grace just to get out of bed in the morning. But that grace is going to be extended to us in heaven. It's going to be amazing. In fact, we're going to be able to dwell with the Lord forever. That alone is because of his grace and his glory. And then he goes on to pray, No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Ladies, it's the idea that God meets all of our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. He's not going to withhold. He's not going to withhold any good thing. But we have to walk uprightly, right? Uh, ladies, we know there's blessings in obedience, cursings in disobedience. Now, you might say, well, Susan, all this sounds great. All this heaven stuff, all this earthly worship, I mean, it sounds great. But, uh, you know, how do I get there? How do I get to heaven? Well, he tells us in verse 12 as he wraps it all up. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in thee. Happy is the man who trusts in thee. The word trust, very interesting Hebrew word. It means to attach yourself, to attach yourself. Ladies, that's how you're going to freely worship God right now in this sanctuary and in eternity. You have to attach yourself, glue yourself to his lordship. You must bow the knee. Ladies, no one's going to be able to worship God in heaven without having made that confession of faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And you'll be saved. The Lord. That means he's Lord. You're not Lord. Without trusting him, and you can believe like the demons do, but they tremble. They have enough sense to know what's going to happen. They're going to be tormented. But ladies, it's, it's turning over our life to him. Deny ourselves daily. Take up our cross and follow him. And so the psalmist, he ends this beautiful prayer by saying, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who attaches himself to you, who makes you Lord. So in wrapping it all up, the psalmist's descriptions of the house of God in verse 1 to 3, he describes the house of God as lovely and a place of rest. Is the house of God lovely to you or do you loathe it? Is it a place of rest on Sunday, or are you restless in the house of God? Secondly, the psalmist's delights of being in the house of God are threefold. We're blessed, we praise God, and we're strong. Are you blessed or bored in the house of God? 
Do you enjoy praising God in this place, or do you pout because you have to go to church? Do you get strength from being in the house of God, or do you feel like a stranger here? Next, he talks about the desire to dwell in the house of God. It's so intense he will wrestle with God until God answers his prayer. It's so intense he would rather be a day there than a thousand elsewhere. And it's so intense he would rather serve in a lowly position than to dwell with the wicked. Is your desire to be in God's house so strong that if hindered from going, you would wrestle with God in prayer or... Would you wish and be happy that you're not there? Secondly, would you rather be one day in God's house than a thousand anywhere else, or would you rather never be there at all? Would you rather do the lowliest task in God's house just to be able to be there on Sunday, or would you rather linger with the wicked? Well, it must have been quite a journey these pilgrims were traveling. Wouldn't it be fun to have a video of that? I think it'd be great. The enthusiasm on the way to Jerusalem, what a journey they had. But ladies, what a journey we're traveling. We're pilgrims in a foreign land. We're longing for worship here, but also for eternity, a new place, the city of Jerusalem. Yes, it took the death of my dear husband to turn my thinking more towards heaven. But I have a dearer friend who has always been there, and he will always be there. His name is Jesus. And my prayer for all of us is that we will long to worship him now more than we long for anything else, and that one day soon we will worship him forever with all those who have gone before us to praise and glorify him forever. What a day that will be. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful prayer. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord God of hosts. I thank you for this church. I thank you that it is a lovely place to be. I thank you that we're strengthened here, that we can worship freely here. What a blessing. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world that have no place to worship. Many of them, they're, they're not, there are not any places of worship. And Lord, how their prayer must be, Psalm 84. Oh Lord, please provide a place of worship. So Lord, may we not take it for granted that we here in America can come freely and worship you. May our hearts long, not only for Sundays, but Lord, for our eternal home. We look forward to that day when we will be with you for all eternity. In Christ's name, amen.